Well, I think we can get going. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, hello, uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nicole Smith. I'm Director of Library and Archives for the York County History Center. Tonight, we are excited to have Ophelia Chambliss with us, who will be speaking about her work with the History Center and her upcoming exhibit that will open at the History Center on Juneteenth this year. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat and we'll answer them at the end. This program and all the History Center programs are being recorded and, uh, and they, they are available at the York County History Center YouTube channel for future viewing. Now, I'd like to highlight a couple of upcoming programs at the History Center. Uh, we have many virtual programs coming up. On uh, this Saturday is uh, our fam annual family day uh, called Who's Your Hero? On February 13th, we have our second Saturday program with Scott Mingus. On February 17th, we have a special Civil War Roundtable program uh, which uh, on the Underground Railroad with Peter Mielli uh, from the Seminary Ridge Museum. On February 18th is our third Thursday lecture on the book Cabal, The Plot Against George Washington. On February 27th, we have Myra Nisi De Shields, who will be speaking on researching African American genealogy. And then also in February, we'll be unveiling an Underground Railroad virtual exhibit on our website. So Right now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Ophelia Chambliss is a historian, lecturer, and fine artist, and has served as commissioner for the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission since 2017. For the past two years, she has worked with the History Center on a grant project um, funded by York County Community Foundation to collect local black history, complete oral histories of community members and help the History Center forge new relationships in black and Latino communities. She holds a bachelor's degree in communications, arts and sciences and a master's in communications from Penn State University. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Ophelia. Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome everybody and thank you for being here for this presentation, which I've done many times before, but I'm always adding to it and it seems to get longer and longer every time. So at some point, if you see Nicole waving at me, it's like, stop, stop. But uh, it, it gets longer and it gets more in depth because this is extremely um, valuable information. I also have several students from my effective public speaking class here who are also going to be watching this presentation. So I'm really interested in doing a good job because they might be grading me on this later. I'm going to share my screen now um, so that you can see some of the work, some of the incredibly valuable work that I have been doing in working with York County History Center to collect this extremely valuable history, which has become even more important and valuable now with the times that we're in as we continue to collect all of this history and information. So a lot of the work that I have been doing has been based on the foundation that the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter until the lion has his own storyteller. And this is so true of much of um, African American history because Historically, the way that the story has been told has only been told from one point of view. It has not always captured the narrative or the description or the point of view of African Americans from um, early colonization to enslavement through emancipation, uh, through the civil rights era. And it's never too late to correct that record. And the, but there are still several challenges to getting that record collect, correct. The work that I did initially started off as a reframing of what um, Black American history is. 
So you'll see a number of paintings throughout this presentation because by trade, I'm an artist and that's how I communicate. That's how I use uh, rhetoric uh, through this visual component that allows people to not only hear what it is I am talking about, but then have this image that also helps to resonate and burn the, the content into their mind so they understand it. So this was one of the very first images that had this um, sepia toned African American couple that was the root of you know, the Southern population of black Americans and then framed on the outside with this art nouveau. So the idea of framing this narrative in a brand new way. So I'm gonna break this down into three parts. Uh, what we know, uh, what we're going to do with this information and then kind of where we go from here. Some of the early components of what we know is, you know, about African American slavery. I am a big proponent of not even referring to African Americans as slaves because they were not, they were enslaved. Uh, the individuals that were brought to this country were, you know, doctors and farmers and lawyers and vets and caretakers who were then brought into these circumstances and then became um, enslaved into circumstances you know, beyond their control. Then we have um, some movement from even before emancipation where some of these individuals were manumitted, meaning they were set free by the people who they were you know, at that time owned by and they set forth across this country, many of them coming north. And I've done um, a lot of work with York PA's um, African-American history. And a lot of my work started with the a wagon load of individuals that moved, who were uh, manumitted from Virginia and came to York in 1827. There was a Quaker gentleman there in Virginia who knew a Quaker in York and said, I'm sending these people there, help them find a place to live, help them find homes and get started in a new life. There were several individuals um, in this wagon load. Some of them stayed in the York area. Some went, went to the Fairfield area, but there were some real notable characters um, also within this. Uh, one of them was the gentleman by the name of Squire Braxton, or at least that's what they called him. Uh, referring to him as a squire was probably making fun of him. And as you can see in this illustration by Horace Bonham, very often you only saw the right side of the illustration and very seldom the full illustration where it's actually comparing him and his raggedy clothing and his mannerisms to that of a scarecrow. So it was somewhat of a derogative image, but that's how he was referred to. But his real name was Charles Granger. He was one of three brothers that came on this wagon load. And he you know, set up his little tin shack on the commons. I think it's a, a space we call now that's the fairgrounds. And they used to, there were several newspaper articles where they referred to him walking through town. He would collect trash. Uh, people would give him old bits of meat which had skippers in them, which were probably maggots that he had to burn off. He got arrested once because his horse was in such poor condition because he really had no food to feed the horse and he fed the horse sawdust. Um, he was, it was remarked that he would walk through town with lots of dogs following him around and he was quite a character. And even though the story was often talked about him, you know, laying claim to this land, um, as it turned out later on, it, we found that he actually did own the land. And there is a deed from Charles Miller who got the land from William Penn. And it is in his name of Squire Braxton. And it details the location and the cost of the land and where it was um, right there in York. It, this could be a problem in terms of trying to find the lineage and who it belongs to because it wasn't in his real name. And very often the problem I found with a lot of the research was that people's names were changed or very often they were referred to as Black Betsy or Black Dorsey or, or Black this individual because very often their last name was that of the person who owned them. So they did not have a last name or their names were changed to fit you know, someone's fancy. So it makes research very challenging, but it doesn't make it any less um, necessary. This is an illustration by a famous illustrator, Louis Miller, who 
did work both in York and in Virginia, which is where um, this group of individuals came from. And this wedding illustration, which I've still been continuing to do some research on, I've so far, or I'm, I'm, I'm laying claim to this being the, the wedding of Hester Oliver, who was another one of the individuals, and you'll see an image of her in a minute, of being the wedding of her daughter, because this wedding was talked about in a lot of the newspaper articles to where uh, people who attended the wedding spoke at length about what a big deal this was, because it was the first um, wedding um, in York that them and their society um, had at, after they had set up homes and, and you know, were able to, to make a way for themselves. So the, the challenge we have with the fact that there were no real photographs and many of the illustrations um, were of derogatory nature, you know, as an artist, I feel that one of my roles to help recapture this story and this history is to paint those images or illustrate those images because just because there is no image to represent this doesn't mean we can't tell that story. So if we have to do that to help tell the story, um, that's what I do as an artist. Um, we have the, the story of William Goodrich, who is known throughout York. But I find it interesting that we really highlight him and his accomplishments, but we forget that there were probably about 200 other um, Black Americans living in York at that time, including you know, this wagon load of individuals and some of their offspring. But then we also have the Goodrich brothers who were rather significant in what they did as photographers. Um, the research that I have found so far um, indicates that they were part of the Paris exhibition in 1900, which was held in Chicago, organized by um, Frederick Douglass and um, W.E. Dubois to capture what they called Negro in everyday life. And this was um, later on in, in post reconstruction to be able to capture um, African Americans doing things that normally you did not see images of them doing. You would see images of them, you know, picking cotton, but you wouldn't see them, you know, sitting and um, with family or riding bicycles or going to school. So they did an amazing job during that time and for a very brief period of time of capturing some of these images and some of this history and these stories. And this reconstruction period was very pivotal um, for black Americans. We had more people in Congress than we've ever had even since that time. Um, it was the start of many um, uh, black colleges and universities because now we had an opportunity for education. So they had to have teachers. I believe the Goodrich brothers were instrumental in being part of some of these images that were taken of people during this time. The exhibition was called Typical Negro Faces, Doing Typical Things, Everyday Life, which we're very often missing in history and in our history books and as we tell these stories, and it really is about changing that narrative about how Black American history is told. They focused on doing images that were formal and informal snapshots, children playing, people working, uh, birthday parties, family outings, interiors of their homes, and them in their finest clothing. So then we get into the, how do we tell these stories? We, we tell these stories by changing the narrative, by taking what we know and then putting them in some context that people can appreciate. I mentioned Hester Oliver as being one of the individuals that came um, with this wagon load of people. And there were a few uh, newspaper articles written about her. The only image of her is this um, older black woman on the left here in this uh, gingham checked dress with this kerchief on her head. But when you read the articles, she was described as the matriarch of this group of 60 individuals. She was also described as a formidable woman of about six feet tall, which was pretty tall for that period. It also said that she could read and that she you know, made a living and was able to help other individuals find a place to live and set up homesteads and find jobs. And she did so with you know, baking cakes and selling those things. But this image on the left doesn't tell you all of that about Hester Oliver. So I painted this image 
I painted her standing so that you get this sense of her height and her stature. Um, I painted a, a, a young girl in the background so that you get the sense that she was in charge of someone and that there was you know, a home and a, and a roof over her head. She's carrying or holding a book, um, which is also significant because it gives you this sense that she could read. And in 1827, for a black woman to be able to read is pretty significant. She could probably only read a few passages from the Bible, but nonetheless significant. And then off to the right there beside her are some cakes and pies. So this for me is, is a component of visual rhetoric that helps tell more of the story about this individual than this image on the left. And that's a lot of what we need to do about black American history. The other thing we need to do is put it in context, give people some point of reference in terms of where this fits in our history compared to everything else. So the project I'm working on now that will be um, open for Juneteenth is a timeline that will go through and it will put things in context. So we'll know while well, this was happening in, in white America, this was happening in black America and they were similar. So we need to really talk about what those commonalities are and how they fit in relation to each other. I like to use this image that really gives a good point of reference. So we have Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, we have Barbara Walters and we have Anne Frank. All three of them were born in 1929. But when we think of them as a collective, we think of them in different time zones. We think of them have, as having lived in completely different spaces and times and generations. But you know, had, were they all alive today, they would still be the exact same age. So we need to put that in perspective. So if we have Barbara Walters still out there doing television programs and shows, she's still within the, time, the lifetime of Martin Luther King, still within the lifetime of, of Anne Frank. So we need to have those point of references and to put that into perspective. So that's what this timeline is going to do. It's going to take what we know of York's history now and put you know, an insert black American history within that so that we can see where they fit together. So that people can realize that while we were you know, farming and, and, and having children and houses and parties, so were they. You know, taking a look at images and giving uh, true recognition to what people have accomplished. Um, military service was a, a huge thing for Black Americans. It gave them opportunities for um, extended, you know, the GI Bill and college educations and the GI Bill and, and the first opportunity for home ownership. And it was a very proud thing, even back with the Civil War, when Frederick Douglass gave his speech on the 5th of July. Um, before Congress to talk about allowing um, African Americans to help fight for this country. You know, he spoke of uh, allow them to get a, a medal on their chest and a, show, and a gun over their shoulder to fight for the thing that they value, allow them to prove themselves men. So when I painted this image of um, Aquila Wilson, I wanted to make sure that the badges and the medals on his chest were clear clearly defined and recognizable because that is what was important to them at that time as part of their service. I mentioned William Goodrich, who was um, you know, recognized as being an, an enterprising business professional in York. He had a barber shop. He uh, loaned money and helped people with their homes. He was uh, a part of the Underground Railroad and then we still look at images of him. And this is one of the murals on the right of William Goodrich, but this image doesn't tell that story. Um, you look and you see the little boy on the bottom and the black girl holding the baby. And it looks like he's kind of like the king of the black folks in town. But in my research, what I found about this image was that what they were trying to depict was him as a little boy of about nine years old and then his slave mother and holding him as a baby. So content wise, we have to be very aware and leery of how we depict and tell these stories so that the, the images are representative of what we're trying to say. Because right now, you know, he's elevated as being, you know, this one black person who was successful when we had, you know, several people who were doing some amazing things for where they came from in that time and in that place. 
And then we have the, the northern migration that continued um, into the York area. Um, this is another painting called Running from a Crow Named Jim. And we've already identified that there are a number of families that came to the York, Pennsylvania area from Bamberg, South Carolina. And um, there are several generations of the people who came here and set up churches and homes and businesses. And it's a key part of their, uh, their structure. Um, in this image, because people were running from the Jim Crow laws and the black codes that basically were engineered and structured to put them back in some form of enslavement and servitude. So, you know, a lot of people uh, fled the South and came to the North. This map indicates uh, the areas that people fled from and you can see by color. So a lot of people in Texas went to Southern California. A lot of people in Alabama and Georgia went to Illinois and Michigan. People from the Carolinas, in particular South Carolina, went to Pennsylvania, and then some went to um, Maryland. So most of the African-Americans are on the outer rims of, of the country, and that still exists to this day. Uh, the Jim Crow laws, laws or the Black Codes, you know, sub passed by the Southern states in 1865 and 1866 after the Civil War, again, were attempts to put them back into slavery. And you can see carloads of people, people left by train, people left by ferries and boats um, heading to the North. So it was a significant moment in um, African-American history. And it was interesting that we have a significant population that came to uh, the York area from Bamberg and uh, quite a few also from Virginia, which is where the original um, wagon load came from. In the paintings and images that I've done, I've highlighted some of the, the stories that we find in the news to where we were able then to go through and identify some of these individuals and then talk about bringing some of these things back like the Miss Fine Brown Frame Beauty Contest where you know, people challenge the standard of beauty and give people an opportunity to feel like, you know, yeah, we, we, we're beautiful too. Um, and then we get up to the, the civil rights mo movement. And a lot of this history and this research also allows us to have, you know, in some cases, difficult conversations, but necessary conversations, because York has a, a racial history that has been very tough to come overcome and it keeps coming back and it keeps getting pushed back down again. So with art as a tool, I, I think it allows us to have some of those conversations and I think it's a very necessary thing um, as people still continue to fight for the same things, poor healthcare, you know, affordable housing, jobs, public transportation, and then still face a lot of the things with, you know, we're in the 60s, they had to deal with the police dogs and issues of police brutality. And then that image on the right um, touches on the abstract idea of what black power represents and the, the concept of you know, self-empowerment and, and really doing for, for one's own. So some of the things that we have discovered in going through the archives that they already have at the History Center. So I has, you know, I, I mentioned that we don't have a lot of these things, but we do. We have a lot of this history, but we have not been geared to or focused on unpacking it, finding it, and then talking about it, and then putting it into context, and then talking about the narrative that's associated with it, and not just talking about it, but letting people themselves talk about it. Because a lot of the individuals that are in these images know these people. A lot of the people that are in these images are related to these people. Uh, the image I showed earlier of uh, Quilla Wilson, you know, his granddaughter, his daughter, his great grandkids, they all live in the York area and they're very proud of him being a part of this history. Um, we, we discovered that, you know, there was, an, uh, York had Negro baseball teams that played very well and they traveled and they were a key part of York and um, they were noted in the newspaper as well. There were several clubs that played and Negro baseball and that ability to travel was a big part of black history. 
One of my favorite stories was that of Ethel Cowles, um, who in the newspaper in 1905 was listed as the only colored girl employed in a factory. So at the age of 20, she claimed this distinction of being the colored girl to work in a factory. And we have a wonderful group of individuals, Samantha Dorm and, and Tina Charles and others who have been doing great work with um, the Lebanon Cemetery, which is the segregated cemetery in town. And a lot of the families and uh, the images that they have, and they were able to uncover an image of Ethel Cowles, which was just added to this presentation the other day, which I think is fantastic. So now we have this story, and now we have this image of this individual to support this. Um, she has family members who are still in the area. And I think these are the sort of things that we need to do. We need to go to some of our, our archives and pull up these images and then really make these connections and bring these stories to life. According to the, the article, the woman that she worked for had gotten sick and was unable to go to work. And so she sent Ethel in her place to do her job so that she wouldn't lose her job. And the factory really liked Ethel and the work that she did. So they had to vote amongst themselves as to whether or not to allow this colored girl to continue to work at this factory. You know, a sort of thing that you wouldn't think is normally newsworthy, but to allow this colored girl to work there was newsworthy. So I'm happy that we were able to find this really good image of her because my plan was to, to paint an image of her. So I think it's even more valuable for her the, the York County History Center, the York area and her family to have an actual image of her in this place. Um, we talk about work and different work crews. I'm uh, also in the process of looking at some of the CCC work crews, the Conservation Corps crews um, and the type of work that the African-Americans did in the area. One of the things with, I found that they had at the archive were images of uh, the York City garbage truck uh, workers and most of them were African-Americans. So when a lot of the black, black population moved in some of these Northern areas, they had to find work for themselves. And many of them were entrepreneurs. You know, no one was going to give them a job so they had to make jobs for themselves. So they would do jobs like uh, firefighters and trash people and the cleanup people, the jobs that nobody else wanted to do because they had to find a way to make money. So some of these early businesses, because you get paid by who showed up at the fire first, you know, those are the jobs that they did. Um, I have uh, an interview that I'm trying to arrange with someone whose father was one of those early firemen that would run the fire horse wagon and see if we can get some images of that. But they did those very early jobs but a lot of those jobs now are municipal jobs. Those are jobs that are run by, you know, city government. So as those jobs, you know, became profitable and structured and were taken over by city government, a lot of the African-Americans lost those jobs. And there are a number of articles out there that talk about when those jobs disappear. And throughout our history, that happens several times when um, a particular population are able to find a way through these jobs, these positions, and then all of a sudden the, the dynamics of them shifts away from them and they have to find new ways and then you have generations of them are unemployed. One of my favorite images that they had in the History Center archives was this image of these gentlemen who ran the York City um, garbage trucks. And so we had this photo in the archives, but we had no names attached in these in individuals. And in conducting interviews and talking to people, I think now we have the names of about eight or nine of them, which I think is phenomenal. So now we've added to this story, we've added value to this history. We are able then to um, talk to some of the relatives of these people and they can tell the stories about how you know their dad working for the garbage truck, how important that was because then he was able to buy them a house and they were the first ones to get a television on their block or they were able to buy a brand new car because he had this work. So we're able to talk about stories that have value 
that add to the quality of life of these individuals instead of just thinking, oh, it's just a bunch of guys on a garbage truck. And those are the types of stories that we need to be telling. And we need to tell those stories from the point of view of what it meant to these families, what it meant to these individuals. And I believe a couple of these guys are still around that we can have those uh, personal interviews with. And it's critical that we start having these interviews now because these guys are getting older and these stories are getting lost. And a big part of what I do is trying to make sure that we're saving these stories because they're getting lost. Um, this is another image that someone brought in and made part of the History Center archives. And I think it's a great photo and I don't have any of the names of the women yet, but I had someone else tell me a story about how after school, the moms used to play softball. So all the kids would sit in the stands and sometimes they would sit there and they would do their homework while their mom played softball. I would love to be able to make the connection between that story of the mothers playing softball after school while the kids did their homework or sat in the stands and be able to put names to some of these individuals. I think that adds a great deal of value to our community. I talk about how many of these stories and these images are getting lost because the young people aren't keeping photos anymore. No one wants to keep, you know, everybody's like, oh, here, take grandma's photo album. Nobody wants that. They're like, I've got pictures on my phone until they drop the phone and the phone dies and pictures are all gone. But we're losing a lot of valuable black history because of this. You can go on eBay and buy boxes and envelopes full of these amazing images of African-Americans doing some amazing things, having parties and weddings and cotillions and you know, uh, ceremonies and um, you know, fraternal organization type things with no names attached to them, no stories attached to them. And I think it is incumbent upon every African-American and every family to make sure that they're opening up a history archive box, you know, and putting it someplace that it's going to be saved, putting it with our history organizations whose job it is to save and archive these things. You know, every family should have a box, you know, on, on our local history center shelf that saves and archives these images. And we have uh, share your history and share your story days where people can come in with their images and, and we scan them. And then you know, we put them in the archives and we give you back your originals and give you a, a thumb drive with these images on it so that you can then share those with your grandkids who wanna keep these digital archives. But it, we have a responsibility to save them. We have a responsibility to make sure that names stay attached, that stories and narratives stay attached to these images so that we don't have to keep going back and recovering and, and forgetting or not knowing where things are and um, having to relive the history again because, oh, what about this? And who is the first person that did this? Um, every few years, we have to endure a, a new Hollywood movie that is sharing with us some amazing accomplishments of African-Americans that we did not know about. You know, a few years ago, it was the, um, the mathematicians from NASA you know, the hidden figures that we're all of a sudden, we're just finding out about these women who were critical to the space program. When people in the area and their family, everybody knew that, that was not something that was widely told. And it's imperative that we start telling these things on a more universal level. And then we start keeping these records for that reason. We, we have to talk about businesses people owned. Um, we fortunately have, um, Brian Wade, who's doing an amazing job with um, the military in our area and being able to capture those stories and those narratives and those histories because um, being in the military was a very important phase and uh, an important step in African-American history, being able to save enough money then to get um, additional education or to buy a home or to open up and buy a business. And being able to then again, take a look at some of these images that are already in the archives and being able to identify. And I believe we've identified this black couple who worked with this family business for a number of years. Um, this reminds me of being there at the History Center one day when 
um, this white gentleman brought in this box of images um, to put into the archives. And then I believe it was Nicole who brought me an image that she found in there. It was a family photo. And in this family photo was this young black girl who's probably, you know, she worked for them and probably did the babysitting and some of the housekeeping. But now that is an image that we need to find out who she was. We need to look at the rest of that family story and find out who was that girl? Who was her family? You know, how long did she work for this family? Where did she um, connect with them? Um, doing personal interviews with families who talked about um, estates that their family worked on as sharecroppers and um, recently finding, you know, this might've been the Livingston estate that the family was talking about. And to them, it was a huge thing. And the, the family was from England and they came you know, a few times a year, but they worked there. And there was a family caretaker who was pretty prominent, who was very nice to them. And then their father finally bought a house in the city and they opened up or he created the first city garden um, lot. And they used to work that lot for a very long time. Those are the kind of stories that we have to collect and we have to collect those stories and narratives from those points of view. Um, I was flipping through this New York Times magazine and came across this image of Isaac Woodard um, and a story that was within that particular magazine. And knowing that Woodard is one of the family names from the York area, so I got curious and I did some research and found out that yes, he was indeed from York and he was, you know, part of um, a case where he was suing the police because he was severely beaten after having come home from service and, you know, bringing this, these things to light because a lot of these things are making national attention. And then we need to then put in context, you know, the importance of the fact that his family lived in York, he lived in York and that they are part of this extension. So again, being able to make these connections and bring all these pieces together. And then the work that continues to happen with the Lebanon Cemetery. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Friends of Lebanon Cemetery and the work that they do uncovering um, these stories, uncovering these histories, doing the additional research through all the newspaper archives. I mean, these ladies are awesome. And, it keeps sending me all these links and there's all these more things to look for. So it's just never ending. And the, the amount of information that we have uncovered over just the past two or three years has been phenomenal. And it, what we need are just more hands and bodies to be um, in there uncovering these things and being able to put it together, but then to have families themselves um, take this seriously and share their stories, write them down, um, make sure that they're saved in a place that they're going to be saved, put them with the responsible organizations whose job it is to save them and to let that continue to happen. Because where we are now in this nation with the history that is just happening in front of us every single day between the pandemic and the insurrection and the inauguration and just so many different things, we don't wanna have to wonder 20, 50 years from now about, well, who was that? And what was that about? And who was that Amanda Gorman girl who spoke? And who is this individual that did this? That we do a better job of recording all of America's history right in line with each other so we can put things in context so that we spend less time going backwards and trying to figure out who we are, what did we do and where did we come from and spend more time making progress and going forward. So I, I am, you know, extremely invested in this, and I, I thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Um, I, I get excited about this every time I speak to this topic, and I'm looking forward to being able to do this timeline for people to really see. I want people to be walking through the thing, going, "Oh my God, I had no idea that was the same time that this was happening." I want people to be in awe. I want them to be as excited about this as I am. And I hope that everybody that's listening to this, you know, ask questions. I hope you will join us on this journey. And I commend the History Center and its efforts. I think they're a real trailblazer in making this happen and being a part of this. So thank you very much for listening. 
Thanks, Ophelia. Um, I know, uh, speaking on behalf of the History Center, we are super excited for your exhibit coming up in June. Uh, we're also going to be um, part part of that is we're going to be borrowing a rare printing of the Emancipation Proclamation to also have an exhibit at that time. So it's it's going to be great. Um, just a reminder, if you want more information about upcoming exhibits and programs, please come, uh, visit our website, which is yorkhistorycenter.org. Um, I, there's some great uh, comments on Facebook from uh, Sam and Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I'm not seeing any questions. If anyone has any questions, please uh, yeah, put them in the chat or the comments. But uh, yeah, wonderful presentation. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Very you. Much. I will stop sharing my screen and um, and just talk about. I mean. I, I showed a few of the paintings that I did for and you know to help tell this story, but there are actually about 25 pieces, and it was part of a series called Casting Shadows, you know, that recognizes you know where we stand in the light, a, a shadow is cast. Because again, to go and support the idea that just because there is not an image that represents this story. Uh, the story needs to be told. And if we need to create images, then so be it. I love every time on Facebook to see other artists going up and taking on the challenge of representing um, Black American experiences and Black American history through visual images and through photographs and through stories and spoken word and poems. I, I think it's wonderful. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked about the scanning opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we've had we're closed right now, but we do hope to be able to offer scanning in the near future uh, by appointment at first, and then hopefully more of our group scanning days like we did last year. Absolutely, and I, and I hope that we can start doing some Zoom conversations and interviews too, because getting those scans are great too but we also want to hear stories you know you know even if a family wants to sit around and just share their stories and, and their memories you know let's get that in writing a lot of this is like playing that card game concentration where all the cards are face down and you flip one over and oh here's an apple oh no oh here's a rock and you flip another one okay oh this one's a pear no here oh here's a rock and like, oh no i have a match here's two rocks and then you be, we're able to put things together so it's in telling those stories and then finding an image, we're able to build this history. And this adds, you know, provenance. This gives uh, credibility to these things that, you know, might have felt like a folk tale to your family. But once we can validate that, I, I think that's amazing. So let's have those interviews. Let's have those conversations. Sounds great to me. All right. Well, thank you, Ophelia, so much. And thank you, everyone that was able to join today. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure and keep up the good work. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.